I'm here with you, McFerlin, B2B process expert, founder of Align.me, the author of The Leaky Funnel and lover of craft beer. You, it's a pleasure to having you with us today. The pleasure is mine, Britta. Thank you. Thank you for accepting the invite. So you, before we get started, I really want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself in your own words, tell us who you are, and even more important, what do you do? What does your company do? So please tell us more in your own words who you are. Thanks, Britta. As the name of the company implies, we are called Align Me. And as the name implies, we are all about alignment, getting sales and marketing onto the same page. Um, the way that we do that specifically is with process design. We believe quite strongly that the way to alignment is an aligned process. It's not about holding hands and loving each other, but rather understanding the shared process. And so our business is around designing sales and marketing processes for B2B companies who have a complex sales and marketing uh, domain, and we design their sales and marketing processes. In fact, I'm just literally right now finished the uh, four, finished a four-hour workshop with one of my clients in Spain, where we're design we're four, in the fourth day of a five-day workshop, uh, designing their sales and marketing process. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Then now after your day, your long day, I know it's already I think 9:30 at night for you. So thank you very much for taking this time with us. So um, before we jump into the key topic of today, evaluate and qualify, I want to ask you one of my favorite questions and I actually ask all my guests. And the question is, what does sales enablement mean to you and how do you define it? I come at the alignment question, I guess, from a marketing perspective or the enablement question from a marketing perspective. Um, and It'd help if I give a, a small amount of context. So marketing is often talking about uh, the four P's or some other device that I don't find particularly useful. What I do find useful is for marketing to split their effort into three buckets of activity. Mm -hmm. Environmental marketing, which you might say is branding and positioning. That's a valid activity, but it's not the end of B2B marketing. It's just a small part in B2B. The second is kind of obvious for B2B and that is demand generation. So we've got environmental marketing and demand generation. And the third task for marketing is around what I call channel readiness, what you call sales, sales enablement. We mean the same thing. And it's around, therefore, from a marketing perspective, what can, sale, what can marketing be doing to equip the sales force to do their job? So I, I come at the question of sales enablement from a marketing perspective, what role can we be playing to help sales to do their job? And just quickly, I'll give you a sense of context. If your market is very immature, then we rely on the sales people to be doing all of the work. Marketing's role is minor and whatever marketing does should be sales enablement, nothing more. It's too early for branding. It's too early for demand. So marketing still has a role, but it's 100% sales enablement. In a really mature market, marketing is critical and sales enablement is less important. So that's my perspective. I, I look at enablement from the marketing perspective. I put it in the context of branding and positioning is nice. Demand generation is critical, but sales enablement is important. And in, in an early market, it's our only job. Well, great. It's a wonderful way to say it and also to take the different perspective for a change from the marketing area because so far we have had three areas but never actually had this key focus on the marketing area. So that's wonderful. Perfect. Great. All right. So let's give our participants of today some deep insights into evaluate and qualify. Um, if you think about this late stage in prospecting you, what are, from your point of view, some major mistakes that can happen or which might even screw up the whole process in the end? So what are your common advices on how to avoid those big pitfalls? I suppose the three most common 
errors I see made, and, and I see these really frequently. And in fact, the first I want to share with you is the one that motivated me to get into marketing. I was a salesperson. Mm -hmm. I was reasonably successful. Um, I was in a company that was doing quite well. So, you know, I was doing okay in an okay company. It's a nice environment. Um, and marketing would come in and completely waste my time. And what I found is that marketing would do training, which did nothing to help me actually go and have a conversation with a the customer. They were talking to me rather than through me. They were not giving me the tools to go and talk to my customer. They were talking at me. And even the slides, I wasn't allowed to use the slides that marketing presented to me to my customer. It's the opposite of sales enablement. So I think, although we're talking about evaluating and qualifying, I want to kind of bridge from sales enablement. And I'd say that the first error, again, I'm coming from a marketing perspective and a process perspective. The first error is not equipping salespeople to do a something. We, talking to the salespeople, not actually equipping them to do something. It's the first error. Um, the second error is a little bit geeky. And um, Britta, if you talk, if you go back to when you and I first met in Mexico City, uh, this is going to take your mind right back. So we talk about the importance of time in B2B, in complex selling. Maybe somebody listening to this webinar has a sales cycle of one quarter, maybe one year, maybe one month. It, it can vary, of course. However long your sales cycle is, in your mind, break the sales cycle into a few stages and think about how long does a buyer who eventually does buy take for each stage? Maybe it's one month, one month, one month, one month, one month, for example. Okay. If that's what they normally take when they buy, then how long do they take when they don't buy? Go and take a look at your CRM data because what you'll find is they take longer to not buy than to buy. And the reason for that is that they're not ready and we in sales are not ready to let them go. And so the second error, first error is, is about equipping. The second mm -hmm. error is that we ignore the importance of time. Yeah. I would plead with the audience today, go and get your CRM data, take a look at what does a successful sale look like? Get mm -hmm. 100 sales and stack them up. What do they look like? Get 100 failed sales, stack them up. Look at the time of each of those and you'll find they are very, very different. It's a simple thing that you can do and it'll teach you what signals to look for when you're evaluating and qualifying. Use time as one of the factors. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, third error I see in evaluating and qualifying is doing it too soon. Um, the BANT qualification method, I completely hate it. And I hate it because it teaches us to ask um, for romantic love before our first date. Yep. We, we, we try to qualify early because we're told, and I think correctly, we're told that we don't want to waste our effort on a deal that's not going to go forward. Good. But look for signals, look for data, don't ask. The question, you know, Britta, do you have a project? Do you have authority? Uh, what is a clear need? Do you have the support of your organisation? If you're just early in your journey, they are completely the wrong questions to ask. More important would be, do you actually have a problem you need to solve? Maybe there's no project yet. Do you have a problem you need to solve? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You think you do, okay. Who else? How many others in your business think that you have this problem as well? Oh, it's only me. I can't convince anybody. That's a good opportunity to qualify out. So asking qualifying questions too early, bad idea. Mm -hmm. Asking penetrating questions that give you signals, good idea. Great. So it's basically the three things you say. It's equipping, analyzing the deal cycle time to see how long does it take to buy versus how long does it take to drop the deal. And the last one is active listening and proper questioning when you speak to your prospect the right time. If you ask qualifying questions too early, not a good idea. If you ask uh, troubling questions early, good idea. Great, wonderful. You mentioned Mexico before, and I think 
already back then when we spoke about it, I remember you said the classical approach for qualification in your point of view is a little passive. Can we explore that a little further? Yeah, yeah. So again, our bosses want us to qualify. So I'm a junior sales guy, as you can tell, I'm only 25 years old, you can tell. Um, and my boss wants me to qualify really aggressively. Wonderful, wonderful, perfect, okay? And so my boss is telling me that I have to qualify this opportunity. Wrong. I have to make the opportunity worthy of qualifying. Mm -hmm. Don't ask, make. Don't ask if they're qualified, make them qualified. And how do I do that? If I'm a good salesperson, I'm not simply asking you what your needs are and then trying to show you why my solution can meet your needs. I'm trying to shape your needs, change your needs even. You think you want a dog? Actually, you want a cat. And I'm going to sell you on why you want a cat. Then I'm going to sell you my cat. So instead of trying to qualify, testing whether they are qualified, that's passive. We are simply reading the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. Make them qualified by helping them understand that the problem that they have is maybe not the one they thought they had, but either instead or as well, a different problem, the one that you can solve better. So that's what I mean by passive and active. It's that rather than just read, change. Mm -hmm. So it's actually also creating the awareness with my uh, buyer, possible buyer, to get in there. Awareness of the problem. So mm -hmm. right now you are thinking about this is an issue. Good. I respect that. I'm going to write it down. Thank you. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. And then, so tell me what else is going on. In particular, can you tell me how this is occurring, what that's happening, who this is affecting? If I ask you the right questions, I'm actually changing your need. Yeah. So rather than testing whether you are qualified, I'm trying to make you qualified. Okay, so it's really also changing the mindset of Completely. the buyer. Completely, Com like digging deeper and getting it further out there. Completely. Okay, great. Thank you very much, you. Um, also in one of our prep calls, last time we were speaking about rhythmic marketing and that we have to create the right to fight, to go on to the market and being ready. What does rhythmic marketing mean for you? To me, the idea of rhythm came in the 2000 tech rec. So um, we had a lot of tech clients at the mm -hmm. time. And as you will remember, uh, we had the dot com, um, but the big beneficiaries of dot com were actually the tech companies who were funding the tech or providing the technology. Mm -hmm. But then we had the, the dot bomb and we had the tech rec. So mm -hmm. the tech companies were a little bit behind the dot com and then they're a little bit behind the dot bomb and they crashed. And I looked at which companies are actually doing okay despite the crash. And they were the companies that stuck to their knitting. And it got, in, it got into my mind that at the time, the idea of rhythm, the idea of I'm, I'm talking to this market and then I'm talking to this market and then I'm talking to this market. But more latterly, uh, you know, if you think about the tactics that are common today, it's different from that was 20 years ago. The tactics that we use today, of course, are very different. So what does rhythmic marketing look like and how do we do it? And how does it tie into my earlier comment about making them qualified rather than asking if they're qualified. Okay. And it's around educating the market. So we know um, uh, until about like two, three years ago, everybody talked about you have to have seven touch points. Now Google put out a study that says you need 20 touch points. I don't know what the number is, but it's true that we are being, our opinions are being formed by many influences, many touch points. We can't simply write a beautiful, beautiful message send it once and hope that it sticks. We have to send 20 beautiful messages. Now, if we're gonna send 20 really clear, really persuasive messages, do I put all 20 of them in an envelope and send it to you? No, I send you an email every month because you've subscribed to our, to our blog. I also post every week on the same topic and I never forget, I post every week. I also, if you visit my website, you're going to see a remarketing tag and it's going to follow you around and it's going to reinforce the message. And it's this idea of 
tell a little, 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 eventually you'll believe. Okay. So rhythmic marketing has got this cadence to it. It's a bit like a corkscrew, you know, when you, when you have a, a, a cork in a wine bottle, you don't rip it out, you turn gently and you pull it out gently. Each turn brings it just a little bit further to the top. It's the same with marketing messaging and selling messaging. It's ongoing and the rhythm implies multiple attempts. It also implies there's a right cadence. And if you stop, you lose everything. If you've been sending a monthly newsletter for three years, four years, five years, 10 years, and then you stop, and then you start again in three or four months time, when you send that email again, it's spam. Mm -hmm. The very person who was getting your emails every month for four years suddenly reports you as spamming after four months. Right? So rhythm means you have to keep the rhythm. Yeah. And uh, based on your experience, did you identify something like an ideal rhythm of one newsletter a month, for example? I think that's something really common, which we have in mind. Do you have any other intervals which you can recommend as a guideline? Um, great question, but I don't have a great answer, to be honest. There's no magic around it. In consumer land, we know that frequency is important. Mm -hmm. So the, the retailers who are sending you an email every day are beating the, the retailers who are sending you an email every week. We know that as a fact. In B2B, it's not the same. Um, and so clearly this, this uber frequency is not such a good idea in B2B. It also comes down to resources. A lot of B2B companies have very thin marketing functions. How many blogs can I write well? How many blogs can I write well that are search optimized? How many blogs can I write well that are search optimized that fit into a topic cluster? How many blogs can I write well that are search optimized that can fit into a blog cluster? That I can also break into multiple LinkedIn posts. It's a limitation of capacity. And so our rhythm has to be a little bit respectful to the customer and a little bit respectful to ourselves as well. What does that really mean as a starting point? A monthly blog is a very good idea. Uh, a weekly LinkedIn post is a very good idea. Um, that's a good start. Uh, and I would say with um, uh, remarketing, uh, for anybody who is more on the marketing side, remarketing ads are those ads when I, I visit your website, then I keep seeing your ad everywhere. That's called remarketing ads. Mm -hmm. There's a right frequency for them as well. If I've just been to your website, maybe for the next seven days, I can see the ad two or three times a day. But after that, maybe it should be two or three times a week. And maybe after that, it should be two or three times a month. And maybe after that, two or three times a year. So there's a there's a, a decay to the right rhythm for different tactics mm -hmm. as well. So it sounds like a really sensitive topic also to define the right rhythm for myself or my company. I really have to dig into the data of what works and how does, does my customer respo uh, respond to that. You do. And, and, and if you do the back end of what you said, how my customer responds to that. If you start with that, what would my customers respect and enjoy? Yeah. If they would prefer actually to hear from me every week with a clever idea, then it should be every week. If they would prefer to hear from me every month, then it's going to be every month. Mm -hmm. So start with the customer, I'd say. Yeah, cool. So everything we said so far from the ribbon on how many times do we actually create touch points and also active listening, right questioning at the right time. What would you think or how do you perceive we should prepare to run the perfect prospect meeting so that ultimately and as an optimal goal, we can actually turn around in the end and say, okay, that's a marketing qualified lead. Sales, here you go. Take it over and make an opportunity out of it and maybe get the deal done. Okay, so to people listening to this webinar, um, you have them at a disadvantage because you know from me already the idea of the buyer's journey. Many know this term, but I, I coined that phrase in 2003. I didn't invent the buyer's journey, it just we didn't have a name for it. So I made one up, I put it in my book and people use this name now. But I wanna use the buyer's journey to answer your question, Britta. Um, a prospect meeting can be at many stages. 
and I can qualify at many stages. Mm -hmm. Are you very early in your journey? And I'm trying to work out, do you actually have a problem worth solving at all? That's a good prospect meeting. And I'll qualify you in or out, depending on whether you have a problem. Now, if I know that you have a problem, but you have a different concept of what you need from what I think you need, regardless of my product, my professional opinion is you don't need this, you need this. Okay. So in my prospect meeting, can I get you to agree to that point? Yes or no. If I can't get you to agree to that point, I should, I should qualify out. So qualifying has uh, implications at many stages. Mm -hmm. How do we plan the meeting? We plan the meeting by knowing which concept they already have in their mind, which concept we want them to have at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. And if we have failed to get them to that at the end of the meeting, Right, so planning is around, I'm trying to get you from here to here. Mm -hmm. And your question is around planning. So that's what you do. What is the concept? What do I want the concept to be at the end of the meeting? And how do I get you there? But from a qualification perspective, if I have failed to get you there, is it simply that I need to go again or again or again? Maybe. Or is it simply that you're not going to get from this concept to that concept? And you have in your idea that you want a dog and I only sell cats and I actually need to qualify out. Yes. So that's a judgment call. Cool. Thank you so much for that. Perfect. You, time is running out already. I see it. I just looked at the time. We are almost at the end. Before I actually open the floor to our participants to ask the questions which have been coming in, uh, one thing, I mean, Corona crisis, we can't deny that everyone is in it for the last couple of months. How do you see the implications of the crisis on prospecting, marketing, and also in regards of sales enablement? How do we need to adjust to that? So apart from the obvious things, we all need a Zoom account. Um, but um, continuing conversations when we all went into lockdown, whichever form of lockdown your country imposed, um, uh, continuing conversations was not so hard. You know, hey, Britta, um, we can't meet, such a shame, let's have a Zoom call. That's not difficult. Starting conversations is really hard. You don't know me, you're a little bit uh, just coping with your own world. And so starting conversations is really hard. So I think the biggest implication is that um, salespeople need to learn new skills or outsource the, the starting of the new fire. Uh, we've got about, uh, I think, 30 sales reps at the moment under our management that we've, um, uh, we are now doing the sales um, or the, the fire lighting for starting new conversations. Because it's easy enough to continue. It's mm -hmm. very hard to start new conversations. So you need new tactics. Okay, Great. Thank you for that view. So maybe let's take on some two or three questions from the audience, um, let me see. Are there tools you would recommend that help you in the qualification process? Yes. These days, almost any CRM does what I'm about to say, but you've got a CRM, but you may not be using it for the purpose that I described earlier. Um, work with your sales ops people to get uh, data about how long it takes a prospect to move through each stage. So most CRMs, most of the big CRMs um, already timestamp when you reach each stage. And so as a management practice, you need to keep the opportunities time uh, up to the correct stage. They're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. And then from an operational perspective, pull the data out to understand what a win looks like, what a loss looks like. So CRM, I know you already have one, but you should be using it for this new purpose, which is understanding the importance of time. That would be my first recommendation uh, as a sales enablement tool. Um, secondly, and again, this one's not surprising to anybody in this call. If you don't already have Sales Navigator, go get Sales Navigator. Just, you have to have it. Uh, you can build amazing filters in Sales Nav. You can build your exactly perfect audience. You can follow what they're doing. You can connect with them. You can message them. Um, you can't do that without Sales Navigator. A basic free LinkedIn account's not enough. You need Sales Nav. Yep. So CRM, but for a job that you're not using it for at the moment. Sales Nav, definitely. 
and some kind of automated email tool that isn't in the control of the marketing department. So you've got Outlook and other mail clients, one-on-one, -on -one, okay? You've got email engines that the marketing department looks at, looks after, perfect. In the middle are email systems designed for the salespeople to send a series of email messages and then to stop if there is a response. There's a few of them. Um, blue tick, we use blue tick. Uh, there's also persist IQ, yesware. There will be three fairly popular tools, blue tick, persist IQ and yesware, which is for automating handcrafted outbound emails. Great, great, super. Thank you for that answer. Um, another interesting one. Can I afford to walk away from prospects if my pipeline is not fully filled up? Oh, clearly, can you afford to be working on prospects that are not going to buy? Every minute you spend on a prospect who's not going to buy is a minute you are not spending looking for a prospect who can. Mm -hmm. So I throw the question back at you. Can you afford to hang on to prospects who are not going to buy? If you have an empty pipeline and you've only got rubbish in it, throw it all out. Super. Absolutely agree. Don't work on it. <laughs> okay, let me see if there is another one which we can charm in here. Um, just one second, please. We had a tool question that we've had at various times in here. So, and also in regards of time, maybe we just uh, progress and take on to the next question. And I think we are. We are at the end of our time. Unfortunately, already it's such a pleasure speaking to you. So many insights. To give something else to our participants. I would be interested to know what influenced you in your progress of your professional life. Are there any podcasts or books you want to recommend to our audience or any people who are inspiring you? Can you tell us something that comes to your mind just spontaneously? Sure. Some of these will date me a little bit. Um, so Jeffrey Moore, Inside the Tornado and Crossing the Chasm, absolute classics. Um, they help you understand market maturity and how to mm -hmm. change your strategy. Must read either book. It's okay. Crossing the Chasm or Inside the Tornado from Jeffrey Moore, number one. Number two, I would say Simon Sinek, Start With Why. I know everybody talks about him, but frankly, he is inspirational. He's very clear and the message is correct. Um, um, so probably, um, look, I know Challenger Sales is popular and Spin is very old, but frankly, go read Spin. It was such a huge influence because it made it clear to me by real data. So Spin was put together by a guy who recorded what salespeople were actually doing. Okay. And what Neil Rackham um, was recording told him that uh, if you ask too many qualifying questions too early, you lose the deal. If you ask for the order too often, you lose the deal. All things are counterintuitive. Um, and what we need is the right questions in the right order. And as a sales enablement, I would say, everybody, if you've not read Spin, go read Spin. I know Challenger is more contemporary. Frankly, Challenger is just a rehashed version of the same story. Go read Spin. It's powerful. Thank you so much for that. I think I agree to that. Spin is really one of the most powerful books I read in these regards. So it's super, yes. All right, you, if our participants want to reach out to you or get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach you? How do you prefer to be contacted? Jump on our website. We've got a squillion uh, contact forms there. Go mm -hmm. to align.me, um, have a read. Let us know if you'd like to have a chat. Super. Perfect. Thank you so much, you, for your time and all your insights. It was wonderful speaking to you again, and I hope I see you soon again in person. It would be wonderful, and also to chat with you again in the next couple Brilliant. of weeks. Inviting me on the show. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. We are at the end of our session. I hope you also enjoyed this conversation with you, McFarland, as much as I did. To give you a brief outlook for our upcoming session next week. I am honored to welcome Melissa Median, the founder and chief fabulous officer of TMM Sales Enablement Services. And we will speak with her about how to further connect, 
how to leverage the art of storytelling and how to develop your deal into a hot opportunity. Thank you so much for joining today and tune in next week. Thank you. Bye.